Well, turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 46. This is a story of a joyful family reunion. Do you, do you enjoy your family reunions? Anyone? <laughs> I suppose that depends on who shows up, huh? One of the many things, one of the many things that have always impressed me about my wife, Stephanie, and there are many, is her family, her extended family, especially on her mother's side. They are very close. When uh, Stephanie was growing up as a child in Seattle, the family would get together, her immediate family, but also her extended family, her grandparents and her aunts and uncles and all her cousins, they would get together for birthdays of cousins. And virtually every holiday on the calendar, they, they love to be together. I didn't really experience that growing up, but, but she did, and her family was close. And for over three decades now, we have been going to the annual Miles Clan family reunion at the beach every Labor Day weekend. This is not the first one I went to, but this is from 1992 when our daughter Bethany was just a few months old. She's, uh, she's there in the lap of Jan Miles. Matter of fact, Ken and Jan Miles used to be members here back in the 1950s, a long time ago. So Stephanie's got some roots here. But things have changed over the year, years. Uh, the, the reunion is much larger than this now. Um, some people have gone on to be with the Lord, and a lot of new people have come in to this family. And we love our extended family, and we always look forward to our family reunion at the beach every year. Depending on who is in your family and how well people get along with each other, how much they love each other. Your family reunion may be a blessing or a curse. Fortunately for Jacob, his sons loved each other. We read last week in chapter 45 how the older brothers were reconciled to Joseph, and Joseph showed them forgiveness and acceptance and love, and he even shared his plan to take care of them and bring all of their families down to Egypt to live with him. So here in chapter 46, we see Jacob, the father, coming down to Egypt and finally being reunited with his favorite son, Joseph, after 22 years of separation. And the whole family is together, and it is a joyful family reunion. However, chapter 46 is more than just a family reunion. This is a major transition in the history of God's people. God is calling all of his people out of the promised land and into Egypt. That is a significant turning point in the history of God's people. But it's not just a family reunion, and it's not just a, a, a key moment in the history of God's people. It's also a chapter of significant importance and relevance to Christians today. This chapter contains important and practical principles for us, especially when we're facing those major transitions in life. And when we're facing those difficult decisions that will affect other family members, this chapter gives us God's wisdom. Before we read this chapter, let's go to God and ask him to speak to us through his word today. Let's pray. God, again, we come to you humbly with great awe, with great trembling and and we are just amazed at how awesome you are. We come to you with great adoration and great appreciation for the power of your word. God, we recognize as we open up our Bibles today that we 
are about to hear from you. That this is your word, your eternal word, and that it is useful for us for, for teaching, for preaching, for rebuking, for training in righteousness, and that your word gives us wisdom that makes us wise unto salvation through Jesus Christ. We recognize that your word is living and active, powerful, and that you have a purpose for your word today in our lives. God, we pray that we would be receptive to your word and that you would accomplish your purpose for your word in our lives this week. God, help us to see wonderful things in your law as we hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis chapter 46. So Israel set out with all that was his, and when he reached Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in a vision at night and said, Jacob, Jacob, here I am, he replied. I am God, the God of your father, he said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again. And Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. Then Jacob left Beersheba. And Israel's sons took their father Jacob and their children and their wives in the carts that Pharaoh had sent to transport him. They also took him, they took with them their livestock and their possessions they had acquired in Canaan. And Jacob and all his offspring went to Egypt. He took with him to Egypt his sons and grandsons, his daughters and granddaughters, all his offspring. Now this next section, the middle part of chapter 46, is another one of those long lists of difficult to pronounce names. So if you know any young couples who are expecting, and they're trying to figure out names, here's a good place to go to find baby names. More importantly, whenever you come to a list of names, especially in the Old Testament, remember that this calls us back to the very first proclamation of the gospel in Genesis 3.15. Right after the serpent Satan tricked Adam and Eve into sinning and sin and suffering came into the world and all the problems we deal with today, God made a promise he said, the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And from that time on, God's people, especially throughout the Old Testament, have been looking through these lists of names, looking for the line, the seed, the, the line through which the Messiah, the Savior of the world, would come into the world and crush the head of the serpent. And of course, we know that we're going to read about part of that line today. The line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah. The Messiah comes to the line of Judah. But let's take a look at these names and do our best to pronounce them accurately. Starting in verse 8, these are the names of the sons of Israel, Jacob and his descendants, who went to Egypt, Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob, the sons of Reuben, Hanak, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. The sons of Simeon, Jamul, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. The sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The sons of Judah, Ur, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. But Ur and Onan had died in the land of Canaan. The sons of Perez, Hezron, and Hamul. The sons of Issachar, Tola, Puel, Jashub, and Shimron. The sons of Zebulun, Sered, Elon, Jahlil. These are the sons, Leah bore to Jacob and Padan Aram, besides the daughter, Dinah. These sons and daughters of his were 33 in all. The sons of Gad, Zephron, Haggai, Shuni, Ezbon, Eri, Aradi, Areli. The sons of Asher, Imna, Ishva, Ishvi, Bariah. And their sister, Sarah. The sons of Bariah, Heber, and Malkiel, 
These were the children born to Jacob by Zilpah, whom Laban had given to the, his daughter Leah, 16 in all, the sons of Jacob's wife, Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin. In Egypt, Manasseh and Ephraim were born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. Then the sons of Benjamin, get this, Benjamin's the youngest son, right? He's got the, the most kids. He's got 10 sons. Check this out. Bella, Becker, Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Ehi, Rosh, Mupim, Hupim. <laughs> it reminds me of the dwarves, you know. Uh, oh, what are, Keely and Feely? Yeah, well, maybe that's where J.R.R. Tolkien got this idea. Mupim and Hupim. And Ard. These were the sons of Rachel who were born to Jacob, 14 in all. The sons of Dan, Hushim, uh, son, he's only got one, poor Dan, Hushim. The sons of Naphtali, Jaziel, Guni, Guni, wow, uh, <laughs> Jezer, and Shalem. These were the sons born to Jacob by Bilhah, whom Laban had given to his daughter Rachel, seven in all. All these who went to Egypt with Jacob, those were, who were his direct descendants, not counting his son's wives, numbered 66 persons. With the two sons who had been born to Joseph in Egypt, the members of Jacob's family, which went to Egypt, were 70 in all. Now Jacob sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to get directions to Goshen. When they arrived in the region of Goshen, Joseph had his chariot made ready and went to Goshen to meet his father Israel. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. Israel said to Joseph, now I'm ready to die, since I have seen for myself that you are still alive. Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and speak to Pharaoh, and I will say to him, My brothers in my father's household, who were living in the land of Canaan, have come to me. The men are shepherds, they tend livestock, and they have brought along their flocks and herds and everything they own. When Pharaoh calls you in and asks, What is your occupation? You should answer, Your servants have tended livestock from our boyhood on, just as our fathers did. Then you will be allowed to settle in the region of Goshen. For all shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. This is the word of the Lord. But how does this apply to us? How does God want us to respond to Genesis chapter 46? And the first thing I see in this passage is that God wants us to respond this way. He wants us to use every blessing to follow Jesus. Use every blessing to follow Jesus. As we've been looking at the life of Joseph, we've seen several ways that Joseph is a type of Jesus. We've seen different events that give us a picture and a preview of what would happen when Christ came into the world. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. In a similar way, Jesus would be betrayed by the Jews, his brethren. Joseph was falsely accused and persecuted, even though he was innocent. In a similar way, Jesus was falsely accused and persecuted, even though he was innocent. And God worked through Joseph to bring a great deliverance, salvation to millions of people. And of course, in a similar way, God works through Jesus to bring about a great deliverance, salvation, to a great multitude, to all who would put their trust in Jesus and follow him. Another similarity between Joseph and Jesus is seen in this chapter, in the way that God is calling his people to follow Joseph. God brought Joseph down to Egypt, and God raised up Joseph to a position of power to lead, not just to save his people, but also to lead his people. And God is now calling all of his people, all of Jacob's descendants, to leave the promised land and follow Joseph down to Egypt. And here we see Jacob in verse 1, packing up everything he owns and taking his whole family and all their possessions down to Egypt to follow after Joseph. Verse 1 says, so Israel set out with all that was his, and when he reached Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. 
Notice that he sets out with all that is his. You see, Jacob recognizes that everything he owns is a gift from God. He says that on, on a number of occasions. He recognizes that when he left his, his father and mother and went up to Padan Aram, to Laban's household, all he had was his staff. And he recognized that everything he got while he was with Laban was a gift from God. God was blessing him. And everything that God had given to him in the land of Canaan were, were gifts from God. And so he wants to use these gifts for God's purpose. And he comes to Beersheba and he offers sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. Beersheba was a special place. God had appeared to Isaac, Jacob's father, in Beersheba. God blessed Isaac there in Beersheba. And, and Isaac built an altar there in Beersheba in Genesis chapter 26. Jacob was alive. He was there. He remembers that time. And that's why he's focusing on this, this way of thinking about God. This God that I'm worshiping is the God of my father Isaac. It was here at Beersheba that I remember God speaking to my dad. And I remember my dad building this altar. This is probably the very same altar that, that Isaac built back in chapter 26 that now Jacob is offering these sacrifices on. And he's remembering those promises God made to Isaac. The same promises that God repeated to Jacob. And Jacob sees all these blessings that God has given him all around him. And so he takes some of the animals from his livestock and he sacrifices him, sacrifices these animals to God, recognizing these are gifts from God. These are gifts from God. Later, after God speaks to Jacob in a vision, they continue on their trip. And verse 6 says this, They also took with them their livestock and their possessions that they had acquired in Canaan, and Jacob and all his offspring went to Egypt. Jacob took everything he had on this trip. He doesn't leave anything behind. He doesn't leave a camp with some servants, a place to come back to. He takes everything. He's all in for God. And he wants to use everything God's given to him for God's purpose. He sees all his possessions, all his livestock, all his descendants all the servants who are with him as gifts from God, entrusted to him by God. And he wants to use everything God's given to him for God's glory and for God's purpose. That's what God wants us to do too. Everything we have is a gift from God. Everything we have has been entrusted to us by God and God wants us to use the things he's given to us for his glory. He wants us to use them to help us follow Jesus and to help others follow Jesus. We're called to follow Jesus, not just to heaven, not just to the place that he is preparing for us, but we're also called to follow Jesus in who he is, in his character traits, in the example that he set for us to follow. And we do that by using what God gives us to accomplish God's purpose in our lives. Joseph understood this principle, and we see that in verses 31 through 32 when Joseph gives his brothers instructions about what to say to Pharaoh. And he tells his brothers that he's going to be talking to Pharaoh and telling Pharaoh about the occupation of his brothers, their skills, their abilities, their experiences raising livestock in all the, uh, the, the resources that they brought with them. Verses 31 to 32 says, Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and speak to Pharaoh and will say to him, My brothers in my father's household who were living in the land of Canaan have come to me. These men are shepherds. They tend livestock. And they have brought along their flocks and herds and everything they own. I mean, this is an important principle for us, especially at this time in history. Joseph wants his brothers to know that they're going to continue to work while they're in Egypt. Even though there's five more years of famine, they're going to continue to work. Okay? 
They're not just going to sit back and let the government support them through the famine. They're going to work. See, work is not a curse. Work is a blessing. We, we've been blessed with a lot of things in life, but one of the things, in addition to all the, the material possessions and wealth that we have, is our ability to work, to be productive members of society, to contribute to the community we're a part of in a positive and good way. And so he tells his brothers, you're going to be a part of this, this nation, and you're going to be a blessing wherever God leads you. You're going to be productive members of society. And God calls us as Christians to do the same thing, to be productive members of society, to use the gifts that he's given to us to make a positive difference in the community around us. God has blessed us with many gifts. Some of these gifts are material possessions and wealth. Some of these gifts are other things, like our time, our experience, our wisdom, our skills and abilities, our ability to work and do something that will be a blessing to others. God wants us to do this as a way to follow Jesus, the example of Jesus, his character, and to demonstrate who Jesus is to others. It's a way to serve others and bring glory to God. Look at what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 through 11. He says, each one should use whatever gift, whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Think about the gifts that God has given to you. Your skills, your abilities, your time, your resources, your connections, your relationships with others? How can you use some of the blessings and gifts that God's given to you to follow Jesus and to lead others to Jesus? How should we respond to Genesis 46? Well, another thing we need to do is we need to make sure that we are not afraid to follow Jesus. Do not be afraid to follow Jesus. More and more in our culture, it's, it's kind of scary to be a Christian. Have you noticed that? I mean, our, our culture is turning farther and farther away from God. And many Christians are finding it more and more difficult to hold on to the moral standards of God's word. Sometimes we face ridicule, mocking, and even persecution for, for the beliefs that we have, the, the, the convictions that we have. But we must not be afraid to follow Jesus even if it seems like the whole world is against us. We need to continue to follow Jesus without fear. You may remember from previous lessons that Jacob had a problem with fear on more than one occasion. And there's a couple times in particular that God had to talk to him about this. And God reassured him, I am with you. And I'll be with you wherever you go. Do not be afraid. And he does the same thing here. So this is the third time God has to remind him, I'm with you. Do not be afraid. Look what he says in verses 3 and 4. Jacob's afraid to go down to the, to the uh, land of Egypt. And so I am God, the God of your father, God said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again, and Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. God identifies himself as the God of your father, Isaac. Isaac, the one who built this altar where you're worshiping here in Beersheba. And God tells Jacob not to be afraid to go down to Egypt, because this is how God will fulfill the covenant promise. I will make you into a great nation there. Incidentally, Beersheba is the farthest city south in the land of promise. Matter of fact, there was a, an idiom, a phrase in the Old Testament 
to describe the entire land of the promised land. The phrase was from Dan to Beersheba. Dan was the farthest city north. Beersheba was the farthest city south. And so here's Jacob. He's just on the edge, the southern edge of the promised land. He says, should I go? Should I go? I don't know. Egypt's kind of scary. Why, why is he scared to go down to Egypt? Well, it may be that he remembers God telling Isaac, don't go to Egypt. God told Isaac that, and Isaac never left the promised land. So he's, you know, he's worshiping the God of his father, Isaac, and he's thinking, okay, Isaac had this standard. He never left the promised land. Is that what I'm supposed to do? Am I supposed to not go to Egypt like God told my father? And then there was this, uh, this prophecy that he heard about that God gave to Abram way back in Genesis 15. And it, it's kind of an ominous prophecy. This is what it says. The Lord said to him, he's talking to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. Now, God doesn't mention the name of the nation. He doesn't say Egypt. But Jacob can put two and two together. You know, he can, he can see that this might be a situation where I'm leading God's people into the place where they're going to become slaves. That's a pretty heavy burden to bear. I mean, God, do you really want me to do this? You know, so he's, he's kind of fearful about this, this next step. But God assures him this is his will. This is part of God's plan and this is another example of the providence of God, how God works in natural events, in the details of history, to maneuver things and work things out for his people, for, the, for what's best for his people. We already saw back in chapter 38 that the Canaanite culture was very wicked, enticing, and tempting to the sons of Jacob. Judah had, had left his father's household and his brothers and went and lived in a Canaanite community. He got married to a Canaanite woman and, and had some kids, and that turned into a huge disaster. So God does not want his people to be raised up into a great nation in the culture of the Canaanites. So what does he do? He works through history through the events of history, to prepare a place in Egypt where Jacob and his sons could grow into a great nation within the boundary of Egypt, but not within the evil influence of Egypt. So that the pagans, the, the unbelieving, idolatrous Egyptians would tolerate the Israelites but not invite them into their evil culture. And we see this in the last two verses of the chapter. This is when Joseph is giving his brothers advice about what to say to Pharaoh. When Pharaoh calls you in and asks, what is your occupation? You should answer, your servants have tended livestock from our boyhood on, just as our fathers did. Then you'll be allowed to settle in the region of Goshen. For all shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. Now, Joseph's brothers were shepherds. That's who they were. So why does Joseph have to coach his brothers into telling Pharaoh the truth about their occupation? Well, think about it. They're going to be talking to the most powerful man in the world. And he's going to be asking them about what they do. And the temptation is to try to think of something impressive to say to the most powerful man in the world and not to say anything offensive, right? And they know that being a shepherd would be offensive to the Pharaoh. But Joseph knows the culture and he knows God's plan for his people. He knows there's a reason why God is calling them to Egypt, and there's a place for them where they will not be corrupted by the Egyptian culture. 
So when, when Pharaoh finds out, oh, these guys are shepherds, and they brought all their livestock with them, well, I don't want them in our cities with our people. Let's put them out in the pasture land where, where we keep all the livestock. And that was good. That was good. I mean, the land out there is the most fertile land in all Egypt because of all the fertilizer, if you catch my drift. Have you ever been driving down the freeway, maybe at night, you can't see anything around you, but you know instantly when you come into cattle company, cattle country, I mean, it's a, you know, all of a sudden, whoa, we're, we're driving through a cattle field, aren't we? Yep, <laughs> that was Goshen. And the Egyptians did not want to live in Goshen. And so this made it perfect for God's people. This was a place where they could be shepherds, where they could have fertile land and be under the protection of Egypt while not be being influenced by the evil culture of the people. In a similar way, God calls us to be in the world, but not of the world. He wants us to reach out to people with truth and love and to be, to be productive members of society and be contributing to our community in a positive way. But he wants us to be different in our values and in our behaviors. He wants us to hold to the standards of his word, even though the culture is going a different direction. And sometimes that's difficult. Sometimes that's scary even. Sometimes we may be mocked, ridiculed, and persecuted for our faith. But remember what Jesus said to the Christians in the city of Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death. And I will give you the crown of life. You know, we have brothers and sisters right now in Afghanistan who are going through that test. And we need to pray for our, our brothers and sisters in those parts of the world where there is severe persecution taking place. But we also need to prepare our hearts for the day when that testing comes to us. We need to be ready and we need to stand firm. We must not be afraid to follow Jesus even in the face of persecution. How should we respond to Genesis chapter 46? Well, we need to help our family to follow Jesus. Look at the way Jacob and his sons helped the whole family to follow Joseph down to Egypt. In verse 5, then Jacob left Beersheba, and Israel's sons took their father Jacob and their children and their wives in the carts that Pharaoh had sent to transport him. I love this word, this Hebrew word for took. It's nasa. Everyone say nasa. nasa. Now, you can easily remember the meaning of this word. Just think of NASA, right? NASA is when you get into a rocket and you're, you're lifted up. You're lifted up and you're carried up. That's what this word means. It means to lift and carry, to help transport, to help move. It was often used to describe a parent picking up their child and carrying their child. This is the word picture that Moses would use later on in the book of Deuteronomy. When the people are about to go into the land of promise, in chapter 1 and in verse 31, Moses reminded them of their 40 years of wandering through the wilderness by saying, God carried you. Nasa, he lifted you up and he carried you as a father carries his child all the way that you've come to this place. That's what God does for us. And that's what God wants us to do for one another, for everyone. And Jacob had this passion. He, yeah, yeah, he was guilty of favoritism towards Joseph, but we see in this passage that he really did love all of his children and all of his grandchildren, all of his people. He didn't want to leave anyone behind. Look at verse 7. 
He took with him to Egypt his sons and grandsons and his daughters and granddaughters, all his offspring. Jacob was concerned about every member of his family. And the text emphasizes the idea that no one was to be left behind. Do we have that same concern for our family members? No one is to be left behind. And what about our spiritual family, our brothers and sisters in Christ? When we see a Christian wandering away, when we see a Christian caught up in a destructive habit, do we reach out to them with love and truth and concern because we care about them and we don't want to leave anyone behind? I think of the story Jesus tells about the good shepherd in Matthew 18. He says, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them, just one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for that one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. In the context of Matthew 18, Jesus is trying to instill in his disciples care and compassion, a, a, a passionate concern about the people in their lives, even the little children, making sure that they don't cause them to stumble, making sure that they don't lose their faith in Jesus, making sure that they are watching over them. And when they sin confronting them with truth and love to bring them back to Jesus and helping them to follow Jesus. Your father in heaven loves you. He doesn't want anyone to be left behind. He doesn't want any of your relatives, any of your loved ones, family or friends to be left behind. And he wants us to have the same passion, the same concern that the good shepherd has for his sheep so that when someone wanders off, we'll be there calling them back, helping them to follow Jesus. What about you? How is your relationship with God? Do you feel like you may have wandered away from Jesus? He's calling you back into his flock, back into his family. And maybe you you've feel like that you've never really been a part of God's family. Well, know this, God loves you, and he wants you to be a part of his family. He's made a way for you to be adopted into his family. He wants you to be his child forever, and he's calling you, inviting you to be a part of the greatest family reunion ever in heaven for all eternity. Have you made your reservations for the family reunion? Our family reunion is coming up in a couple weeks up at Ocean Shores, Washington. Last year, there was not as many people there because of COVID. But uh, there's one person in particular in the family who was very passionate about having everyone there, Jeff Kyle. And he was, he was kind of getting irritating with all these texts he was sending me because he was making sure that everyone had their reservations confirmed. And he was calling the hotel and different members of the family and texting back and forth. He was kind of the go-between, making sure that everyone was on board to be there at the family reunion. He was passionate about it. And I even, you know, had to text to my wife so that she could text to some of her family and, and, and call them and make sure that, oh yeah, we're all, yeah, everyone's on board. We've got our reservations confirmed. We'll be there. Well, there's, I, I appreciate that about Jeff. I, I enjoy his passion and his commitment to that. But you know, there's an even greater family reunion that we need to be passionate about. We need to make sure that our reservations are confirmed for the family reunion in heaven. Are yours confirmed? Have you put your faith in Jesus and turned away from sin? Have you been baptized in the name of Jesus 
for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is your confirmation of your reservation for the great family reunion in heaven. If you are a Christian and you just feel like you've been drifting away, remember, God is your father. And he is, he is that father of the prodigal on the front porch of the house, waiting, calling to you. And when he sees you, he comes running to you with open arms. He loves you and he wants to bless you. He wants to welcome you back into the family today. We're going to pray and we'll sing one more song before we're dismissed. But as we do that, let's think about how God wants us to respond to his word today. Maybe he's calling you back into his family today. Maybe you're being called for the very first time to give your life to Christ today. Don't put that off. Confirm your reservations for God's family reunion today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for what you've done for us through Jesus. We come to you in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, knowing that he paid the price for our salvation, for our entrance into the kingdom of God, and for our invitation and adoption into your family forever. God, we are looking forward to that great family reunion in heaven for all eternity. And I pray if there's anyone here who has not confirmed their reservations, that they would do it today, that they'd put their faith in you and be baptized into Christ today and not put it off. We give you glory and honor and praise. Thank you, God, in the name of your son, Jesus.